Oh, there we are. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sarah, Sarah Blasco. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Blasco. Yeah. And uh, Dave Hunt, who is going to be playing uh, piano too. Hi, Dave. Um, so, thank you very much, Sarah, for coming and doing this. No worries, Robbie. Well, radio is a magical thing because I'm now about to transport you down to our, our music studio, the uh, romantically titled Studio 227, which has been the uh, place for some very fine recordings and is about to be uh, for another because I'm joined today by Australian singer-songwriter and occasional dancer, Sarah Blasco. Hello. Hello. How are you? Welcome along to the Inside Sleeve. Thank you. Nice to have you here. I feel honoured. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Now, uh, we invited you along to this studio because we had a beautiful grand piano mm -hmm. and we thought, I, I've seen you play piano before, and yeah. we thought you, you'll be there playing the piano, but n no, yeah. you've brought somebody else. I have. I've brought David Hunt, my longtime pianist and friend. So <laughs> Hello there, David. Yeah. Welcome along. Was there, was there nerves about playing the grand piano yourself? Um, no, I mean, I, I love playing piano, but I, sometimes I find it, much less distra distracting to just sing, so it's nice to do that. And and Dave is very capable, as you know, as well. So. He is indeed. <laughs> and he does love a Steinway piano, which <laughs> is what you've got here. So right. I thought it would be cruel not to invite him. Now, you're not the only two people that we invited. We also invited a, uh, a bespoke Radio National audience here today. And welcome along to you as well. Thank you for coming. Um, please welcome Sarah Blasco. We'll come back and have a little bit of a chat, but let's launch into something first up. Of course, your most recent album, I Awake. What would you like to play? Uh, yeah, to start with, we're going to play a song called An Arrow. was 
more than the eye could see Very, very nice. Sarah Blasco performing live for you today and An Arrow from the new album, I Awake. The writing for this album was done uh, a long way from where we're standing. It was done in Brighton, wasn't it? And paint the, the scene and the mood for us where it was because it's obviously a long way from your home but I take it it's a, a emotionally a somewhat bleak spot from time to time too. Uh, yeah, I just found myself living alone in this house in Brighton um, for a year. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'd been living uh, in London for a year before that and been do doing a lot of uh, travel around Europe and around Australia. And um, and at, at that point I felt quite exhausted and so um, I decided to make this move to Brighton to somewhere that was a bit quieter and where I'd have time to reflect and to think and to start writing a new album and um, so yeah I, I spent a lot of time on my own and a lot of time walking um, you know and by the water and um, it was very grey and windy and there's these mournful sounding seagulls which I think I remember talking to you about before I made the record actually. Is there a need to, uh, to, to place yourself in an environment that pushes you emotionally to try and find what you can do as a songwriter? Uh, well, I, I don't like to necessarily rely on that, but I do think that um, it can be a helpful thing to place yourself somewhere that you're not comfortable. And um, I mean, I'm just interested in, in experimenting, really. I mean, um, with each thing, you, you try to experiment with something different. On the last record, I set up an office, and um, <laughs> and on this record, I lived in a house in Brighton, and mm. who knows what I'll do for the next record. But um, and, and in a way, it actually. It was sort of partly a conscious sort of choice to move there and write a record, but then on the other hand, it, yeah, it just sort of ha happened that way. So, mm. yeah, but um, I do think that it's interesting to see what your environment does to the way that you write. Because the other part of the world that has a very distinct environment is Scandinavia and Sweden where you've spent quite a bit of time too. And what you, I wonder what your attraction is to that um, you, there seems to be a need for you to return there for some reason as mm. part of your songwriting or part of your, your recording at least. What it's, what's the attraction for you? Uh, I think partly, well, to start off with in Sweden, my attraction was to work with a particular producer who was Swedish and so that's why I ended up there. And um, But through working with him I learnt a lot and um, uh, I learned a lot from the way that he records and, um, yeah, he's got really great taste, yeah. Uh, in music and and with sounds and um, and so um, we we were recording in this beautiful um, 1960s studio and I really just fell in love with that place and that old style way of recording um, I really enjoy because I love playing live and to find a studio that um, is really conducive to playing live you know as in the whole band tracking together um, in a really beautiful big space that kind of seems to uh, make you feel like you're doing a concert or something. Um, so I think it's partly been the studio that has kind of attracted me uh, to go back there. But the people that work there um, are really, yeah, really really great with that kind of old style mm. sort of technology. So, yeah, yeah, but you see, it's <laughs> an interesting uh, a approach to the process, isn't it? Because it's very different to what you can do digitally yeah. uh, in a studio these days and that is to pull everything apart into micro little moments mm. and uh, almost weave it together like a tapestry. And I, I, I wonder within that process of using an old studio what it is that it gives you that you feel is energising to you. Well, yeah, like I said, it, it's that we, we basically were just in a room kind of like this um, all on carpets and playing together, looking at each other and... Um, sometimes you can be really separated from each other in in the recording studio, and I, I don't like that. I love to feed off the energy of of you know, particularly the drummer. And um, but yeah, it's it's a really great feeling. But um, also in these beautiful old studios, there's um, there's reverb chambers, which for a singer is a really incredible thing because it's um, so these are in, instead of uh, these days electronically we put reverb onto singers. Yeah. In the old days, they actually had tunnels underneath the studios with yeah. big plates that you could. Uh, uh, move up and down with a big winch and that would give you the, the mm. reverb. They'd actually pump it down with a speaker yeah. and give you that. 
which is a once again it's a it's a fairly old fashioned yeah desire isn't it yeah i just feel that that kind of well the the reverb chamber at this particular studio is a little concrete room and um i just feel that it's like nothing it because you're doing it just specifically for your own voice in in that moment and you're hearing it back um it's I have always actually not really liked reverb um, until I went to this studio, <laughs> and because the reverb's very different, it's almost like got a bit of a distortion. It's got a grid on it, and and I, I love the fact that you know a lot of the old singers like Nina Simone and Aretha Franklin and and people like that, that they recorded in studios like that. And I mean, I'm not saying that everyone needs to record like that, but I find it quite thrilling to record in a place like that because it feels. It feels exciting. It feels like a performance and, um, yeah, it's got a sense of history. Um, I mean, the the guy that works in this studio, um, he's been working there for like 40 years or something and um, it, it feels a little bit like sometimes that it it's becoming like a bit of a lost um, tradition, you know, uh, and I, I find that sad because he's a, he's a really talented man and there's such a technical knowledge um, that he that he has, so... Sarah Blasco is with me today. We have uh, Dave Hunt on the grand piano and a little live studio audience here on the inside sleeve. Let's take a little listen to some more from this new album. Of course, very stripped back and we'll come back and have a bit of a talk about um, what you did in uh, in Bulgaria for this yeah. record. But uh, we don't have the, um, the reverb room, I don't think, but we still have a very nice room to, to sure you... sing in. What would you like to play for us next? <laughs> um, yeah, this next song's called Fool. I've been thinking about what you said when we met Myself back, I'm my worst enemy. There's truth in what you said, but it's not what you meant. You would have me believe it all just so I would repent. so long I forgot I was strong but I know myself now and I know I was strong
Sarah Blasco performing live for you and Fool from her latest album, I Awake. Uh, let's talk about ambition for a second. And I'm talking about musical ambition as opposed to career ambition. But um, this album is very ambitious for a number of reasons. First of all, you've produced it all on your own, which you've never done before. You've written all the material. But, of course, the most striking element to it is the inclusion of a, a full orchestra, which is an ambitious approach for a musician. You started out, really, your first ever EP was very insular. It was almost a bedroom recording. And here you are, what, a decade later, and it's become this incredibly expansive uh, approach, this sweeping approach to your music. I'm wondering what you feel is the internal motivation for that trajectory? Um, well, I think if I'm to be honest with myself, I've always wanted to work with an orchestra. So it's like, it just was one of those things. I think I wrote it down as like one of the things to do before I die kind of <laughs> uh, situation. Um, I mean, I don't know. I think just with each album, I've I wanted to do something that just interests me in some way. Uh, I mean, it's just sort of as simple as that. I mean, I did start out uh, doing bedroom recordings. Um, my EP was most definitely <laughs> um, a bedroom recording. And um, from there, I don't, I don't know. I just have these – I'm a very kind of instinctual um, – person who's driven by their emotions <laughs> and um so with each uh with each project it's like i i don't know i just sort of want to do something but different. what what is it in the in the sonic palette mm. that attracts you so much to it um well this album i wanted it really to be about contrasts because when i started writing it um I was mostly writing on ukulele and, and guitar and and some and piano, um, and I, I just kept imagining how wonderful it would be that um, in sort of opposition almost to this very simple instrument with voice, um, how magnificent uh, an orchestra would sound and um, uh, yeah, and so I was just sort of like going into this imaginary world um, and thinking about that. Um, but yeah, m mostly because I wanted it to be about about contrasts, and and I also wanted to, it to uh, to push it further than the last record, and I wanted it to have a connection to the last record, but just really give everything that maybe the last record didn't give, uh, or give more than maybe the last record did. So I mean, the last album had a lot of strings on it, um, but it was like a quartet. And so I thought, well, a nice way to push it further would be to have an orchestra. <laughs> to have a full orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> and you look to some of the um, the great masters who've used it so well, and I'm, I'm not talking about conductors, but people mm. like Serge Gainsbourg and mm. uh, Leonard Cohen and, and those sorts of singers. What did you see in their work mm. that you wanted to emulate? It? Well, I see, yeah, that, that music is kind of having a yeah definite pop element. Um, and I... I mean, the song Avalanche um, by Leonard Cohen, uh, I heard when I was a child and it terrified me. Uh, I mean, those strings are terrifying, the way that they seep in and then they overtake and they really give this sort of feeling of, of an avalanche. And, um, you know, Serge Gainsbourg as well uses strings in a really powerful way. Um, I wasn't interested in making a record that was um, very polite with its use of strings. I wanted the strings to, if they were going to be there, to have full impact mm. and to really toss people about and, um, yeah, the, the, in the same way that the sort of the trajectory of the emotion within the song, I felt that the strings should really be the thing that um, pushes that along. And it's a tricky balance though, isn't it? Because when you're dealing with a full orchestra, the idea of, of having that attack or having that precision mm. it's it's a, a bit like trying to steer a very large ship yeah. Uh, yeah, what did you actually learn in that process about trying to um, straddle those competing aspects uh well i think we chose the right place to do it because i think bulgaria um i think that there was something kind of um in their souls or their something in the way that they played very it was very passionate and a lot of the um a lot of the yeah the very passionate very intense uh points in the in the writing 
uh, they found very easy to, mm. to follow. I mean, I do think it's something to do with the culture and the music. That and, people... and for you culturally, of course, it's quite mm. close, isn't it? Yeah. Well, on my dad's side, um, we've got Bulgarian heritage. So I uh, felt it would be a really wonderful thing to go there. And, you know, for my, I mean, my, gran- my grandfather is uh, still alive and um, he's like, he's uh, 90. And uh, I thought it'd be wonderful, f- you know, uh, for him and for my dad to, to do that as well. So. When you're actually in a place like that, because you recorded in, an, was it a Soviet era room that you were in? Yeah, it's this big old um, radio hall there yeah, in Sofia. Yeah. Mm. Um, you had Nick Wells with you to help with the, the arranging. Yeah. It is, they are waters that are tricky for uh, a songwriter that's come from a, a non classically trained background. I mean, you haven't trained in. Um, in, in arranging for orchestras yeah, in no, the past. And there are, for, yeah, for, for notation like that. And there are a lot of songwriters who have um, f- have fallen over in the pursuit of those sorts of lofty aims. Mm. I mean, w- were there times where you felt like you were swamped by this this need to f- you know, feed this great requirement, this whole orchestra, when really what you're delivering is something very personal? Yeah. Well, it was very, it was very daunting because I knew that there was the risk that uh, well, very strong risk that it wouldn't work, and um, you know, I, I didn't. Uh, Nick and I were very careful the whole way along. We kept saying we didn't want it to be like um, hooked on Blasco, you know, where it was just like, oh, we're just like doing the strings for the sake of it. We really, we really had to think that through because I personally, I think that sometimes when I hear that someone's done an album with an orchestra, my first assumption is that it's going to be really boring and watered down and kind of unnecessary or you know and so I I really felt like all of those things were were very prominent in my mind and yeah just not wanting to make that kind of record and um yeah sorry what was your question (laughs) I can't remember either but I I feel like we've all been illuminated from it (laughs) Uh, Sarah Blasco is uh, is with us today and we have uh, Dave Hunt on the grand piano the Bulgarian symphony orchestra are hiding somewhere in the building yeah and some singers Bulgarian singers Uh, did you have Bulgarian singers too did you yeah (laughs) how exciting but um (laughs) thankfully the the songs still benefit from being stripped back so it's just you and a piano and they they still have body and form with that in mind, let's take a listen to a couple of songs. What would you like to play? Okay. Yeah, we're going to play two more songs, I believe. Um, this first one's called Cast the Net. I know you're given to a change of heart. Forward but still. You know you must There's a comfort in what you know But there's a time for letting go And though it hurts, you're better off The decision Feel the 
truth inside. What you long for is hard to find when you're a victim of a change of heart. You're a victim of your changing. play one more song for you. Um, this is a song called Not Yet. No. 
in the final hour all will be said and done but all I know is that the hour will come lovely stuff Sarah Blasco thank you ever so much uh, Sarah singing and Dave Hunt on the piano and four of the songs from I Awake the latest album for Sarah uh, we heard An Arrow Fool Cast the Net and Just There Not Yet uh, Dave and Sarah thanks so much thank you thank you all The Inside Sleeve with Robbie Buck on RN.